Unless you already read the video title, you are never going to guess what's in this box. I bought another dirt cheap import vise of dubious quality. Specifically, a six inch Unib City machine vise. And to be honest, have absolutely no idea why I'm so excited. Completely unwarranted. Like it said on the box, this is a six inch vise and it's meant to replace the four inch vise I currently have on the milling machine. The little four inch has been doing great, but it's just a smidge on the small side for this mill. If all goes well, I'll install the new six inch here and move this four inch to my manual mill. It'll replace this ROM vise. Absolutely adore this little vise, but the four inch Kurt clone is a lot more versatile and 100% transparency here. This thing has picked up a bit of slack in the fixed jaw and for the life of me, I can't figure out how to tighten that out. If I hold work too high up in the jaws, I pick up a lot of deflection from this fixed jaw, which ends up in out of square parts. I can't figure out how this fixed jaw is attached. There's a bolt in the top, some kind of adjustment nut, another bolt from the bottom, but everything spins when I try to tighten it and nothing gets tighter. That, however, is a story for another time. But what's not a story for another time is just how massive this new vise is. I mean, look at this thing, it's silly. Box says it weighs 50 pounds and I believe it. I haven't even taken the plastic off this thing and I'm already wondering if I shouldn't have gotten the five inch vise. It's very oily. There's some scratch marks from the moving jaw. We'll check those out later. The handle leaves a little something to be desired. The paint's just jumping off of it. First impressions, this is probably be the first thing to break. Doesn't feel bad, maybe a little bit on the snug side. The pessimist in me is wondering if it's not tightened a little too much to maybe hide something. Not making any accusations just yet. Just a dumb guy talking out loud here. I don't know, looks pretty good. Quick backstory, this is an eBay vise. I paid just shy of 150 for it, including shipping, or free shipping, I think. As if anything's ever free, right? 150, that's like $3 a pound. Less than I can buy raw cast iron for. I don't know how they do it. I mean, I kind of know how they do it. But just between me and you, I don't see this race to the bottom ending well for anyone. And yes, I do see the irony in me contributing to that problem. Which brings me to the three questions I see written all over your faces. First, yes, I have been eating better and getting some exercise. Thanks for noticing. Second, also yes, I have made this video before. I did a full breakdown and inspection of the four inch vise when I got it. I'll basically be doing the same here. Almost exactly the same. In fact, I'm not even sure if I'll release this video, but just in case, figured I'd get it all on camera, do all the editing, add graphics, tweak the sound, and make a thumbnail. You never know. Third, and probably most important, I hear you all asking your collective self, this old Tony, now that you're a YouTube millionaire sex symbol rock star, why are you wasting your time with a cheap vice like that? It's probably junk, you know it, we know it. Why not just get a Kurt, orange, or whatever high quality USA made vice? My friends, that is an excellent, if a bit long-winded, question you ask. Where do I even start? First, this whole turning good metal into scrap metal is a hobby for me. And although I'm a strong advocate of always buying quality when you can, that, unfortunately, has its limits. I probably wouldn't skimp on measuring tools, or maybe hand tools in general. Certainly any tool you reach for or depend on on a consistent basis. But you have to stretch the clams out where you can, right? I mean, I have three or four machines that I'd love to deck out with all the best stuff, and each of those machines would likely benefit from two or three different style vices. Well, you get the point. It's a slippery slope. Sure, if a Kurt vice just fell in my lap and after I got out of the hospital, I certainly wouldn't turn it down. But for what one of those things cost, 
And I'm not saying they're not worth it, but for what one of those cost, I could buy five of these, pick the best one, throw the other four away, and still have money left over for a nice dinner. Mind you, this would be a very different story if my livelihood depended on the quality of my equipment. If I were doing this for a living, I probably wouldn't look at a vice like this twice. Second, and probably more important, you should know I suffer from a medical condition called workshop-induced financial exhaustion. Best not to exacerbate that. But hold on just one minute there, cowboy. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. I still don't know if this is even usable yet. It might not even pass as a chunk of cast iron for the scrap bin. You may or may not have noticed, not counting the size, these two vices look a little different. I'm not 100% sure on this, but this style is typically referred to as a milling machine vise, and these are CNC vices. Of course, either one would work in either situation, but the CNC variant has two things going on. First, it has no mounting flanges built in. You have to use hold downs or toe clamps, or some other way to fix this to your machine table. Hopefully you can see this has sort of the mounting lugs built in and this does not. I believe this is done so you can get more of this style of vise on a machine. You have more workstations as it were. Additional work offsets so you can run more parts per setup. Things, you know, you might want to do on a CNC machine. There is one potential catch here though with this quality of vise if you want to use it in sort of a gang arrangement like that. Holy smokes, this thing is gigantic. If you buy the big name brands, spend the cash, you can get matched vices, meaning their height or dimensions from the bed is identical or to within some crazy small tolerance. But if you have two or more vices, it probably pays that they be exactly the same. With these lower cost imports, odds of that happening are probably pretty slim, I'd guess. Though they do spec a height tolerance, so who knows. And in addition to not having flanges, these are ground all over. In theory, you could mount these on their sides or on their top if you had to. I don't know if I'll ever need that, but this Maho can be swapped into horizontal mode. You can do horizontal milling here. And I thought this might be a nice option to have. One thing I do like about these flange devices that I think I'll miss is the little gutter they have cast into the perimeter. That helps keep coolant on the machine instead of running off your table. Not an issue, of course, on an enclosed CNC, but I don't have one of those. On my smaller mill, for example, the ROM vise can and has made a mess when I'm running coolant, even at low flow rates. I'm not talking about those CNC style fire hydrants. Any coolant that ends up onto the table in the T-slots drains to the coolant pan by the design of the machine. But the ROM vise likes to take a good portion of that coolant, divert it over the table and right onto my feet. Where the four inch vise would catch that coolant, again in this gutter, and run it back towards the center, out these cutouts and onto the T-slots. I don't know if you're hearing that hesitation in my eyes, but I'm not finding what I expected to find under here, and it just dawned on me. I assumed eunuch body on the box was a typo for a unibody, as in single body. You see on this vise how the fixed jaw is cast directly into the vise body and machined all as one part? Compare that to the four inch vise, where the fixed jaw is a separate part that's bolted and keyed onto the body after the fact. Assuming this material and casting is good, unibody, I imagine, would be preferred over a two-piece vise. But now I realize why it's called a eunuch body. This vise has no ball. Let's talk just a minute about this angle lock feature that's been plagiarized into this vise. See how the nut on this vise screw has an angled surface? A greasy angled surface? The nut that rides on the screw engages with the moving jaw via that angled surface. The inside of the moving jaw has an undercut that matches that surface. So this sort of hooks on and drops down. It's caught under that surface. When this style of angle lock or ang lock vise, Kurt style vise, pushes on the moving jaw, when you tighten the screw and squeeze the vise, it's not just pushing straight in. Because of that angled surface, half of that clamping force is going straight down. It's holding the moving jaw 
down onto the vice body. And that's to mitigate what's called jaw lift. When you tighten stuff in the jaws of a vise, the vise is closed across the bottom, but sort of open on the top. It's like a C-clamp. Those clamping forces tend to lift this moving jaw, which makes a vise frustrating to use. They don't always lift, depending on where you clamp the part, but jaw lift is something very real. And this ang lock feature, this angle lock feature helps to mitigate that. Thing is, the two angled surfaces usually have like a spherical element between the two of them like a hardened steel ball, that creates a more efficient transfer of force from this angled face to the angled face inside of the moving jaw. You probably can't see it, but these are just rough cast surfaces. I mean, really bad stuff. It's like lunar surface type casting. And you can imagine if those two mating surfaces aren't clean and parallel, the component of that force that pushes down, well, I guess even pushing in, could try to kick the moving jaw all over the place. And then it would rely heavily on just the small machine features that keep this aligned to the body, right? The body drops in that little machine's track or groove or slot. That's actually pretty good. But those would have to resist any weird torque from this angle clamping feature. As it is, it's really just two rough cast faces covered in grease. Oh, wait a minute. There is a ball in there. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. They're usually, I think, flipped up sort of that way, domed out to interface with the angle on the moving nut. But if I could get this out of here. It's a half sphere that's just a smidge taller than the divot it's sitting in. Is that a patent avoidance feature or is that how the Kurt ones work too? I could have sworn these were Audis and not Innies. Well, that's pretty cheese. It's like a cast ball bearing or something. Not very round by the looks of it either. But I guess in theory that does the same thing. Better force transfer between the angled nut and the moving jaw. I don't know. Maybe it's nothing. I'm sure the vise probably feels a little crunchier than a Kurt. No surprise there, perhaps. Anyway, let's keep breaking this thing down. What an emotional roller coaster ride. Took the nut and the screw out. Mixed feelings here, but nothing I'm gonna complain about given the price. Was pleasantly surprised to find a bearing in here, a thrust bearing. I for sure was expecting like bushings, bronze thrust washer maybe. Not the best bearing in the world, but you know, it's a bearing. The screw threads look clean. They're regular 60 degree coarse threads. The ad led me to expect Acme or trapezoid threads because you know, it says it in the ad. After the chintzy vice handle, this will probably be the next thing to go, depending on what kind of parts you work on, how hard you're clamping. Either those are the ones cast into the nut. Time will tell, I suppose. Okay, okay, enough with the screwing around already. Let's get serious here. Settle down now. The vice is completely broken down. I degreased it a bit, stoned down some of the sharp edges, and went through this thing methodically with a fine-toothed comb. Although fun and relaxing, I learned absolutely nothing. So. I switched to an indicator. I checked all surfaces for flatness, parallelism, and squareness. I had planned to walk through this with you in excruciating detail, but as it turns out, there's already a super awesome video on YouTube with some old geezer doing the same exact thing. So if you're curious how that looks, go check that out. Before I share my conclusions here, there's one thing that might be worth recapping, measuring squareness. Judging by some of the comments in that other hacks video, squareness wasn't that clear. How to measure it at home, rather. So let's head back to the... This is a surface gauge, and it has a test indicator mounted to it. The whole works, the surface gauge, the indicator, and the part we're inspecting are on a surface plate. The indicator, in and of itself, can't actually measure anything. It's not like a tape measure that is telling you the cold hard truth. An indicator instead compares two things. That's all it can do. In fact, sometimes they're called comparators. Set up in this way, it's comparing the position of its tip to the top of this granite plate. For example, if I slide this indicator over the top of my part and I zero it out, that isn't actually telling me anything. I don't know how tall this part is. I don't know how flat it is. I just don't know anything about it. All I did was set up a reference between that tip and the top of the surface plate. Magic happens when I start to move the surface gauge around. For example, if I pull it up towards the fixed jaw, we can see the indicator increased a thou and a half in this case. 
So I still don't know how big this part is, as in taking a measurement. But what I do know is that this part of the surface is now a thou or thou and a half higher than this part of the surface. What looked flat actually has a bit of a ramp to it, a bit of an increasing curve. But even that is only true because I'm assuming my surface plate is flat. It could very well be that this top surface is perfect and my surface plate has a one thou hole worn in the top. Again, it's only comparing the two. At the risk of losing my already thin grasp on reality, my assumption is that my surface plate is good. So I mark this as plus 10. I measured this with a tenths indicator, so that's 10 ten thousandths or a thousandth. Plus 10 because that's coming up. I did not mark my surface plate minus 10 because it's going down. Because mental health. If I wanted to actually measure this, I would need a gauge block or a stack of gauge blocks of about, you know, the same height. Then I can compare the two and then either add or subtract from my gauge block stack until this thing tells me zero difference between the two and only then do I know how tall this part is. Again, the only thing this thing is doing is comparing. All right, that's all fine and great, but now let's say we wanna measure the squareness of this side, how square this is to my surface plate. Well, if I just run my indicator into it, it doesn't really do much. I mean, I guess if I try hard enough, I could break my indicator, but that wouldn't tell me anything about the squareness. In order to figure that out, we're gonna need something else to compare this to. We'll use the indicator to compare this surface to a known square surface, just the way we compared this surface to a known flat surface. My apologies, I know that hurt for some of you to listen to, but it's important we establish the rules of this game. So we've got a known flat surface that we're comparing other surfaces to. To get the perpendicularity, we're going to need a known perpendicular surface part to set our indicator up against, so then we can go to town with our part. In this case, I just pulled out a one, two, three block. I actually use a granite reference square. These two surfaces are 90 degrees to each other, comes with a certificate, all that nonsense. So again, so we don't lose our minds, it's something we can trust. I appreciate not everyone has one of these or is willing to buy one of these. So we'll just use a known good one, two, three block. Or you can use a V block, a grinding vise, anything you trust to be perpendicular, anything you trust to be square. This is very important. All of the other measurements we're about to take on the part we're interested in will be based on this. If this is off, all of the readings will be off. Here's the bit that I think confuses some people in this type of squareness measurement. You can buy more expensive, dedicated squareness measuring kit, but it's gonna cost you at least an eye, maybe a kidney. I'm not sure what the going prices are for those things these days. It's been a while since I've been in that business. Anyway, squareness refers to two surfaces. You can't have just one square surface. It's gotta be square with respect to something. The surface gauge only has one bottom surface to compare to. We need to somehow adapt this to measure a second surface perpendicular to that. And you may have noticed this indicator has a bumper installed on it. I installed this myself. You could just mill a slot in these and then lock tight in a piece of mild steel, whatever you like. Just sort of grind it round so it has a you know high spot on the front. How round this is or what the radius is is not critical. Let me set this up and I'll explain what we're doing. I've set up the indicator so the tip is just barely touching the one, two, three block when the one, two, three block touches the bumper. Basically, I've set it up so I'm within range of my fine adjust. Let's take a look from the top. Now, if I roll my block around that radius bumper, you can see the indicator picks up a maximum point of contact. Right now, it's making it to about six, seven thou. Again, my part is up against this bumper. And because it's round, that results in a high spot. What I'm gonna do is look for that high spot and zero my indicator to that. Now, any place except that high spot, the indicator will fall away from. The indicator never goes past zero. And there we have it. The surface gauge and indicator are now set up to measure squareness. Let's pull our part in. I'm gonna run this bumper into my part, being careful to keep constant contact between that bumper and the part that I'm measuring. And just sort of roll it in and see if I can pick up the high spot with the indicator. So it's going past zero. See, as I roll it, the indicator is coming up, hitting that max, and then coming down again. The max reading looks to be about one division on this indicator, which is five tenths. That's half of a thousandth of an inch. Because it's going past zero, that means this surface is leaning in towards me. Remember, this is our squareness reference. And when we zeroed it out, this is what squareness means. So if the indicator is coming closer, it means the part's coming closer. This vise, three inches up from the base, is half a thou out of square greater than 90 degrees. 
So that's how you measure squareness. I hope that cleared up a few things and didn't make matters worse. Now I know what you're asking. What if I don't have a surface gauge with a bumper? Well, before I installed this bumper, my surface gauge was just a regular surface gauge. This one is smaller, but you'll get the idea. Surface gauges have this notch cut out of them. You can see the original one back there. And in a pinch, you can drop a ball bearing in there and use that as your bumper. That's how I measured squareness for years before I got so fed up with losing this ball that I installed that bumper in it. But you know, maybe a magnet or some grease or something. It's the same idea. You just use that ball as the bumper you roll your indicator around. To summarize, I am absolutely shocked, if not flabbergasted, that I didn't get more than I paid for. Granted, there are two sides to every story. First, it's a piece of junk. Sorry to be so blunt. But on the other hand, it was 150 bucks. It did come with this little report card, inspection report, technology document, operation instruction, test certificate packing list. I don't even know why they ship with these things. This little accuracy test does call out ZBJ52017-90, which in granted two seconds of Googling, I could not find. It's got a permissible error and an actual error. Actual is not filled out. You know, I wrote this stuff in myself. The pencil is me is what I'm saying. These specs are in metric. Now I'm totally good with metric. Some of my best friends are metric, but from, I don't know, half a millimeter up to about 20 meters maybe. Above that, I'm completely lost. 100 kilometers means absolutely nothing to me, even though I know exactly what 60 miles feels like. And ditto for the low end. 0.015 millimeters, I get that that's a small measurement, but it's not the same as 6 tenths to me. So I just use Google Translate, so it's talking my language. Though I haven't been able to completely figure this out. I think some of these images don't go with the text. Like G1 is parallelism of top guide surface to vice bottom, but that to me looks like this picture, parallelism of measuring block top surface to vice bottom. That one looks like it's got a block in it. I don't know, I just sort of gave up. But I think the actual columns is left blank for a reason. For example, I saw jaw lift. Where was jaw lift? Lifting and measuring block. Permissible is 6 tenths. I'm measuring a smidge over a thou. Almost double permissible. The vice body isn't square, it's trapezoidal, the sides aren't parallel. The jaws are remarkably square, but there's a thou dip in the bed. They maybe did this fast and hot and the middle came up, or the palm sander they're using to surface grind this needs to be dressed. But here's the thing, ideally a good vice, properly mounted, should be almost invisible to use. Like it becomes part of the milling machine that you trust. Sure, you have to use proper technique, make sure everything is clean, etc. But I would not recommend a vice like this to the sort of person that its price tag is likely to attract. Case in point, the bed is rather flat in the X direction. Fixed jaw is square. Clamping force seems good, even though there's a bit more jaw lift than they technically don't permit. But that starts to fall off pretty fast in the Y direction. It goes from a thou down to zero in the span of two or three inches. If you have small parts in this vise, you could probably get away with that error. But if your parts start to reach mid-span, which is very easy to do since you bought a six inch vise, then you'd pick up a one thou error per side. Flip your part over to the machine the other side, and now you're the lucky winner of a two thou error. Sure, as a hobbyist, you can probably make this work, but you have to be constantly mindful that the vice might be working against you. Part of me was hoping the gamble would pay off. You know, maybe they're getting better at making cheap stuff. Sure, the iron might suck, it might crack in half if I squeeze too tight, but maybe I could get away with it the way I did with the Taiwanese Vertex vice. Despite everything I said, I think I'm gonna try this vise on for size until something better comes along. For the amount of work I think I'll do on this mill, I get more from the added size than I lose from the extra attention I have to pay in using this thing. As you can see, I did make some clamps to hold this thing down, and in its defense, it does technically squeeze stuff and works for now as a CNC vise. All right, so that, maybe some buyer's remorse, is all I've got for today. Hope you enjoyed that, and thanks for watching.